I know you're going to dig this. and uh, single digits as far as playing the piano. And now when you say single digits, is that like five or six? About five or six. Okay. And uh, from there, as far as um, getting started, just playing, some of my music teachers were people like uh, Virgin May Happy. Uh, she was my uh, music teacher years ago. Uh, uh, there was Mrs. Upshaw, Florence B. Upshaw. But uh, as I grew, Next, I started getting into high school, and there, some of the biggest influence I had was a, a teacher by the name of Clarence, uh, uh, Mr. Spencer. And um, anyway, that, that was quite an experience there because I had a chance to go to Roosevelt, which had a lot of other really strong musicians there. You had uh, Junie, Walter Morrison, uh, we all went to school together. You had Derek Floyd, who's Currently, he's off doing his thing, and uh, it just surrounded constantly by the whole music thing. Uh, then, it, as far as uh, the whole thing with Slade, that actually came about as a. Well, wait, wait, we want to go back because you, you, you. <laughs> let, let, let's go back to an elementary school when mm -hmm. you said that you went to Edison. Yes. Edison. And so, when it, who, first of all, I need to know, are there any other persons in your family that were musical? Yes. <laughs> yeah, my, my dad, he played trombone. And uh, that's how I pretty much got started. I remember he, uh, he bought a, uh, believe it or not, my first instrument was clarinet, not piano. And ended up, that was, uh, I played a clarinet that was owned by my brother. It was. Uh, or my stepbrother, and uh, that's how I got started. Then my dad, I don't know why, he went and bought this piano. It was a, it was a piano called a Lester. It was an old Lester piano, and I hated it because he was very strict. I mean, it was like... Now how old were you then? Old. How old were you then? Oh, I was single digits, you know, six, seven years old, and he was very strict. I mean, it was like, you know, you had to practice like... 30 minutes a day, and the bad thing about it, I live, we live right across from Edison School, right across the alley, so I could see my friends out playing, I'm being forced to play this. But it, in the beginning, it was very rough for me because I didn't really want to do it, but because I was a very, believe it or not, I was, a, I was very much an introvert as a young boy, I was very much an introvert, but my music was a way for me touching people. <laughs> Especially when it came down to girls, I, I was not the type of person to talk to girls because I was very shy, but I could easily play something for them and like, wow, you know. Kind of like a poet in music. Yeah, yeah. So, yes. 
So that's how pretty much how I got started. My mom, she well, she sung. She sung a lot. And at the time of we were at Mounting and Missionary Baptist Church. And that was my first paying gig. Uh, I was getting paid five dollars a week. And when you play piano? Yeah. You were playing so you, so how old were you then? Wow, that was around just before starting high school, so that would have been around Ooh. Seventh or eighth grade? Yeah, because I remember about the same time that was when WDL got started. That was the first time I heard heard WDL. Okay, well, so, so about that same. So year. so now we're getting into the era and, and starting mm -hmm. to formulate who you are. So did you participate in any talent shows? Did you play in uh, Roosevelt's band? Because at that time oh, Roosevelt yeah. did have a band. Yeah, yeah. And because yeah. you were playing piano. We know you weren't marching on the field no, with a piano, no, no, no. so were you playing the clarinet? No, I was playing saxophone. I switched over to a tenor sax. And now, I, when did you do that? That was in uh, high school. That so, so you went, right. you left the clarinet and switched over to tenor sax, and did that for quite a while. Did well. well what did you like years. about the instrument, tenor sax? What did you like about that compared to the clarinet? Just the gutsiness of it. And, and at the time, too, my, my dad, he was uh, starting to expose me to jazz. You didn't hear too many clarinets. Sure, you, you heard Benny Goodman, you heard people like that. But then all of a sudden I pick up an album and I see somebody that looks like me. Wow, John Coltrane. Wow, all these other people. Now it, it, I like jazz. I'm, I'm really getting into that, which... My dad, another little side story, my dad used to beat the crap out of me because I would take his albums. They were all 33 and a third, and I would slow them down so I could learn the parts. And he gave me this tickets. So now, did your father ever play uh, in any gigs around town? No, no, he no, just, no. He, he just, just played personally. Yeah, because uh, back when he was young, he used to play himself. He played. And uh, it's funny because he would sit down with me on the piano, and he'd play his little part. But then at some point, I remember he told me he just had to walk away because now I was out playing him. I was doing things that he could not do, never even imagined. But he was always supportive. He always, hey, I want to see you do this. If this is what you wish to do, I mean, it's, I'm there to support you. That, that, that's really, that was really uh, an admirable thing for him to be doing at that when you were young like that. So when you, you're in high school now, tell me what about your high school experience with music. Well, high school was really interesting. First, uh, my first time I started, I was at Roth High School. I was there for one week. And then Mr. Spencer found out that I was at Roth and he came up and got me out, transferred me on the very same day. And I went to Roosevelt, thank goodness. <laughs> because Roosevelt was a whole different animal. It, it was like, a, I don't know if you remember the TV show Fame? Yes. It was the closest thing to that. They lived and breathed music there. Everybody was very, very serious about what we did there as far as music. And Mr. Spencer was very, I, I remember the first day when I came in, he embarrassed me big time. He told me to sit down and play a song and it was um, Handel's Messiah. Well, I decided to add some notes that weren't on the music. He embarrassed me right then in front of everybody. Made me get up and sit down. Wow. The first day. <laughs> and But it taught me a lesson. It taught me, don't add anything to the music. Play what you see and nothing more. But uh, as far as uh, Spencer, he was very supportive of us. Uh, matter of fact, we had a little group by the name of, uh, well, it was just a, just a bunch of us getting together. And what we would do, go out to try to encourage kids to come to Roosevelt. So he would actually let us go out and play. And it was myself, uh, Junie, Junie Morrison, um, um, Derek Floyd. And we'd all go out and we'd just play. So we'd actually, were almost like recruiters to help elementary school kids, hey, if you want to get into the arts, this is the school to be. This is where you need to be. <laughs> Did you ever participate in any talent shows? Yes, quite a few. I mean, up at Roth, up at Roth 
quite a few there, and most of those was with uh, with a group called the Four Corners. I played with them for for I don't know how many years. I played with them, and that was quite a, an experience because we had uh, Larry Hines. He was on guitar. He passed away from leukemia, and then we had uh, Curdy. Uh, he was on drums. I was on keyboard. Then we had bass player Lloyd Lloyd uh, Jones, and we. We were probably, I'd have to say hands down, probably the baddest group here. And the only, and the only other group that, in, 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 matter of fact, at the talent shows, there was only two groups that we would, people would want to see because they know we would go toe to toe with them, and that was Lakeside. And we, we just loved every time we'd go at each other. I mean, we just, sometimes they'd win, then sometimes we would win, but we respected each other because, yeah, these guys, they, they're unbelievable. They compared to spirit. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes. But there was no, you know, there was no hate behind it. You know, we just, hey, we all loved our music. We all loved, we're all passionate about what we do. They did what they did. We were mostly leaning toward groups like Yes and uh, uh, more of the rock type feel, whereas they were more of the R&B. And the funk. Mm -hmm. They were more in the funk area. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you, you kicked around playing with Four Corners, and, and, and after that, what, what happened with your musical career? Then Slay came along. <laughs> now, now, okay, are we finished high school, or are we still in high school? No, we're, we're, we're beyond high school now. So where this are would, we now? This would be around 19... But where, what, what happened after high school with, with uh, you and your oh, musical well, career? After high school, I decided to try to go to college and, and that was a very odd experience because ended up uh, I didn't really know what schools I wanted to go to. I had gone out, I, I put, uh, got accepted at schools like uh, Eastman School of Music which is in New York. Um, I believe it or not, I tried to get to University of Cincinnati. Didn't get accepted there but I got accepted at Eastman. Go figure. <laughs> But uh, anyway, from there, it, it was more of a, um, what do I want to do? So here I am at Wright State, and at the time... So you didn't go to Eastman? You went no, to I ended up going to Wright State University, and looking back, maybe that was a mistake. I, I should have, some people were encouraging me, you should have gone to Central or Wilberforce, or my high school teacher, he wanted me to go to Bluffton. That's where I should have gone because I went to Wright State and Wright State at the time was predominantly white. There was not too many of us out there. They, they had just started the, uh, what they call the Black Students Union and I was just there like a duck. I, I, was in, I was only 16 years old, number one. So you finished high school young? Yes. So I'm 16 years old here at Wright State, no driver's license, no nothing. My parents didn't want, I stayed on campus because I couldn't get along with my parents. I couldn't, there, there was some things, there's a little bit of dysfunction there. So I ended up staying at the school and it was, it was pretty rough. I mean, as far as the music, because nobody could, Nobody told me that you're not supposed to be carrying this much of a credit hours and trying to work and do all this other stuff. So I just burnt out. And it was too late. By the time the Black Student Union got hold of me, I was already, I was ready to throw in the towel. I just had enough of them. So the next thing you know, I did that for about two years and then I said, I'm going to pro. And that's why I ended up with uh, groups like Platypus, and really kind of okay so uh, so I, I want to go back and I want to oh, oh, oh I gotta fill this in so you at Wright State mm -hmm. you spent a couple of years there you get burnt out because you never were acclimated to trying to work go to school and, and pursue your dreams which was music <laughs> and so we're in here two years so I make you about 18 or 19 because you went to college yeah, at yeah, 16, yeah, yeah. you spent two years, I'm giving you two and a half. So we're somewhere between 18 and 19. So 19 years old, 
and you're no longer in college, and now you're talking about platypus. How did you, how, 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 how did that connect? Well, well platypus. No, wh where did you well, meet them? I trying to remember, where did I meet those guys? How they even got hold of me? I, all I know is I, I ended up with them. And we, uh, 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 Ray, I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out right now how we're gonna connect these. What was your instrument of choice at this time? Keyboard. You were doing keyboard. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the two years that you spent at Wright State mm -hmm. was keyboarding. Keyboard. And now we're leaving Wright State, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to figure out from you where did you go. And how did you meet platypuses? That's what you're going to start with. What did you do after you finished, after you dropped out of school? That's when I hooked up with the, with the Four Corners. Uh -huh. Actually, it was Four Corners, not platypus. They didn't change the name to platypus until, wow. So, Four Corners, now, okay, I, I'm trying to get this synchronized because Four Corners was playing when you were in high school. Mm-hmm. Is that right? No. No. Okay. No. But you, but you did no. mention Four Corners when we were when you were in high school with when we talked about the talent shows. Well, we saw them. I played with other groups on talent shows and saw that I didn't really get hooked up with them until yeah, it was after high school after I graduated. And that's when I got hooked up with them, which was, I graduated in 1970. So, so uh, moving right along, we're going to go from the Four Corners. So when did you play with the Four Corners? Ooh. And, and how did you meet them? Good question. <laughs> There was there was other groups that I played with. There was a, there was this one group named Stone Soul Image, and I'm not sure if that how I ran into them or. or no, where 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 were you playing with them? That was before Four Corners. Yeah, no, but Stone where Soul. where? That would have been around. No, not they. Where? Oh, where? Yeah. Uh, we just did a lot of clubbing. That was about it. Where? Is, um, was it in Dayton? Was in it Dayton. in Chicago? No, 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 was no, no. it Dayton? Dayton. Okay. Dayton. Yeah. Dayton. And, and you know, and, and, and Ray, I'm not trying to be difficult, but just your story, and you have a chance to tell it. And so I'm trying to make sure that we are able to pull out specifics. And so I'm, I'm, I just want you to be specific. So, because this is your story. But please this understand, is, this was 40 years ago. But this is, but no, no excuses. The brain, no, the no, brain ex, no excuses. So, no excuses. So, so uh, I, I want you to accept my drilling here to try to, to get this sequence of, of events in order. So, I, I want to go back to when you were doing talent shows, mm -hmm. and that was Roosevelt versus Roth, and it would be Dunbar near me. I know that they would do. What was the name of the group you played with when you were doing talent shows in high school? Okay, one group was. Well, I can't say we were really a group. It was Derek Floyd and myself, and uh, let's see, Floyd Weatherspoon. He's he was one of the singers. Uh, Junie, he was one of the singers. So that was one of the little groups. Mm -hmm. So name was really not important unless you had to. Right. So you would come up with something important. Then after that, we. Uh, we went from there, we went to college early at 16. How did you get to college at 16? Um, my mother, it, well, at the time, really couldn't afford to have somebody take care of me, so I ended up, I, I started school very early, <laughs> elementary school. So I was a last key kid. I mean, I ran around with my key on my neck and stuff. But the good thing about it, I lived right in the back of school, so it was no problem. I just and plus the windows wide open at the school, so they saw everything. I could, I'm not, I could, I could, I couldn't even play hooky if I wanted to. I tried to, but they would see me. <laughs> but 
Okay. But yeah, but that's how I ended up going to college, going to finishing high school early. so yeah. early. Um, so okay, we we went through that and we went through the two years at Wright State, mm -hmm. and now you are doing what? We're we're out of Wright State. Right. We're, we're we're chilling. We're getting ready to make our next move. Yeah. Pretty much the first group uh, that I got started. So where did you meet them? Uh, I'm inclined to say it was probably at a talent show because at the time I was playing with a group called Stone Soul Image and uh, this was uh, myself, uh, a guy by the name of uh, William Wright, nicknamed Bimbo, he played, played bass. And then we had uh, uh, Mark, Mike Hicks, who was Drax's brother, Mark Hicks. He was playing guitar, excellent guitarist. I mean, he mostly did a lot of jazz stuff and uh, ended up, I was pretty much the one who came up with the name Stone Soul Image because pretty much it was Sly and the family, Stone, then we're playing soul music and we're gonna be the image of Sly and the family. So pretty much we had, that, that was our whole concept as far as the thing with the group. And we did this for a lot. We did a lot of talent shows and blah, blah, blah. And then we ran into, um, uh, um, I can't think of the guy's name, uh, Reggie. Uh, they had a group. Anyway, it was a, a kind of a doo-wop group, and they needed some musicians to play behind them. So we said, okay, fine. We'll, Reggie Crutcher. It was Reggie Crutcher, Ronnie Crutcher, and, and anyway, Mr. Crutcher was their uh, manager. So... He asked us to play back them up, so we ended up their backup group. And I think later, that's how I ended up running into Lloyd and all the rest of the guys with Platypus or Four Corners. They saw me and I agreed and I said, fine, heck, I'll go ahead and work with you guys. So Four Corners was the, the group before they became Platypus. Mm -hmm. So they're one and same. One and same. Same people? Pretty much, pretty mm -hmm. much. I mean, about the only person I don't think was there with Platypus was Dana Myers. I mean, Dana, matter of fact, I just talked to Dana. It hadn't been 40 years, I, I talked to him a couple of days ago. But yeah, he came in, he was there, but then when they went on and went on and did their thing, they went on and got, uh, I think a guy's name now. He replaced Dana. He got up there and he replaced him. So that's when they changed the platypus and then went on to. So what's the history behind the name platypus? Um, something unique, an animal that has a, a, a lot of unique parts, which is what the band was about. A lot of unique parts all coming together. And if you look at a platypus, it's got the, a bill of a duck. It's yes. got webbed feet. It's got fur on its back. So it's like several different things, all components, all blended together. That's what the name platypus was all about. So how long did platypus stay together? Wow. I have, what, two years or something like that. So they did have a hit record. Or, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they did. Um, in fact, uh, they might have more than one hit song. They had one. And so, um, and the name of that song was? That's been a long time. Dancing in the Moonlight. They, Dancing in the Moonlight. And so, Vladimir's hit song was Dancing. Were you on that album? No. Okay, so. I'm, I'm, I'm still working here with you, Ray. We, we did four scores, you, uh, in four corners, you were with four corners, and then four corners became Platypus. Mm -hmm. But when Platypus had their hit, you weren't with them. No. no. Okay. No. So, where did you go after Platypus? Uh, after Platypus, I believe there was, um, I did a little bit of a stint with, uh, uh, well, at the time, her name was Little Dot. <laughs> and that was, that was very interesting. I mean, playing with her, I mean, she, 
mostly did just all female R and B type stuff. But uh, it and was, where was this? Um, wow, we did a lot of clubbing. <laughs> That's well, all I could say. Round town, just around Dayton. In Dayton. In Dayton. In Dayton. So. And we did a lot of that, and then uh, pretty much played with her for a while, and then from there. That's when, yeah, I, the whole slave thing kicked in because, uh, and that, so how did, how did you get hooked up with slave? Accident. <laughs> well, uh, I used to live, I used to live on Decker and just down the block was Mark Hicks where they used to practice at. And, uh, I would go down there and just, just watch them every once in a while and just watch the group and, and, uh, ended up. They asked me, somebody had told them, well, yeah, well, Red Plex keyboard, blah, blah, blah. And at the time, they had one keyboard. Uh, they had uh, 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 Carter, Carter Bradley. He played mostly just Fender Rhodes. That's all he played. <laughs> he, would, he would never touch a synthesizer or anything like that. So they approached me and asked me, hey, how would you like to join the group? I said, oh. Okay, maybe, you know, not my group, really my style of music I like to do, but okay, I'll, I'll give it a shot. And next thing you know, I think it was during, it was 1976. Yeah, it was right after we had the big snowstorm, the blizzard here. I remember packing up all my stuff and we were headed for New Jersey. <laughs> so the whole, all of us, and then all of a sudden we're winding up at this place, uh, 208 North Maple in East Orange, New Jersey. We're all piling into this house that already had a family in it because it had uh, Steve Washington's family, his mother, his father, two sisters, and a, and a big dog named Herc. <laughs> so here it is, all of a sudden we walk in, as you can see there on the back of that album, it was, what, 10 of us? So that's on top of what's already there. And we come in with equipment and everything and being set in the living room. <laughs> and we're all living in this house under one roof, which was interesting <laughs> to say the least. Uh, I'm sure, but, but, but how did you get to this house? I mean, who invited you to this house? Steve I mean, Washington. Steve this was, was, this was his, his parents' house. So Steve yeah. invited you to the house. Yeah. He invited the band yep. to the house yeah. to do a gig in... Well, we did our first gig there. We did it in... It was in Newark. Yeah, we played an outdoor gig there. And that was very interesting because it was, I, if I remember correctly, it was raining that night. So, so uh, when you were doing that, I... Um, so there you are, in Newark, at an outdoor gig, 20,000 people living in the same house. No, just kidding. <laughs> How long did you stay there? I was there for, for quite a while, until there, there was, at, at, at one point, uh, I did decide to uh, leave the group and then move next door, and just, to, just because I needed a break. I mean, because we were all there, and it's, and if you can imagine, you get ten guys together, and we're not everybody's got their own mindset how they like to do things, and so on and so forth. So we did that for a while, and then later we ended up moving to West Orange, New Jersey. They hooked up a house there for us to stay, and we ended up staying there, and that was. Very nice. I mean, nice neighborhood. I mean. So, how long did you stay uh, on the East Coast? Wow. About the whole time. The whole time. No, no, no. About five. About five years. The whole five time. years. Okay. Five years yeah. you spent in five, five in years. New Jersey, mm -hmm. traveling, uh, doing the circuit of the East Coast, or just New Jersey? No. Pretty much doing uh, what they call the Chitlin Circuit is what we pro mostly did. And when I say Chitlin Circuit, that would be your southern cities, your your things, that sort of thing. Your southern thing. Matter of fact, we only did like uh, 
at one time we did get hooked up on a, a very good gig. It was, um, uh, anyway, it was with, uh, I'm trying to remember some of the groups that were over there. Well, I, I want to go back to the, okay, you're on, you, I'm trying to get on the chicken circuit. You, you're stationed on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. So when I think of the chicken circuit, I'm thinking Tennessee, Georgia, exactly. Exactly. Alabama, exactly. Florida, Arkansas. Exactly. So you all would drive all the way down from New Jersey? No, a lot of times. Well, yes. No, we had a really nice bus, tour bus. <laughs> A really nice tour bus, and we did a lot of touring on that bus. There was a company by the name Connections, and it was a customized bus. I mean, uh, insured for a million dollars. I mean, just had just everything in it. I mean, really nice tour bus, and we just toured every place. But we never, we never left the states. We never did any gigs out of the states, not at all. We never went to Europe. No. Canada? No. No, Mexico? <laughs> no. Yeah, that, well, we know when you think back, we reflect that. Uh, so, now that was when you were with? That's yeah, Slate. Slate. Mm -hmm. And so you're on this album, and I'm going to show it, Slave, The Hardness of the World. And on the back here is a picture of the players, and we also have a picture of Ray Turner. However, uh, I think it's interesting to note why this album was called The Hardness of the World. Tell, tell us about what was going on during that time for, because that's, that, that's, a, that's a very profound statement for an album that we're talking about, funk music and and when you think of funk music, you you don't think of the blues, and you don't really think of rock and roll. You, you kind of think about things that's going to keep you moving a little bit. And so to have the hardness of the world, it would lead you to believe that uh, something was going on. And you have songs on this album called Life Can Be Happy, the great American funk song. Can't get enough of you, baby, sinister, and and then that's just side one, and then we hit side two. The world's on hard, <laughs> and uh, the party song. We can make love, and the last song is uh, volcano rupture, which I think the people in Hawaii would be playing this song about now. So. <laughs> So tell, tell, tell how you got that title, and tell about the experience of this album. Where you made it, where you, where you produced it, how, how, how did you do it? If I recall correctly, this album was done at the uh, House of Music up in Jersey, if I recall correctly. But uh, at the time, <laughs> when, this album, when we did this album, there were some very bad things going on back then. Uh, one, you had the Son of Sam killer who was terrorizing New York. So if you can imagine, we had to go back and forth between Jersey and New York. It was somewhat unsettling. And then you had the, uh, uh, the New York blackout, which we were able to see that from Jersey, which is definitely unsettling when you're looking across and you're seeing Empire State Building, all the lights go out, just nothing. <laughs> So we really, and plus too, we were having problems with the, a little bit of a friction between the record company and us. So we didn't really have much to, to be happy or be proud about back then. I mean, we're kind of going through a, a state of transitional flux. But uh, it wasn't until after this album, the light came on and we introduced two new members of the group. And they were like a, a shot of Red Bull for the group because we definitely needed those two people. And one was uh, C.L. Carter, Charles C.L. Carter, and then the second was Steve Arrington. Well, they suddenly things really started. We started seeing things differently as far as 
our music, how we're writing, how we're doing stuff. And that's why there's such a big difference between this album and the next one, which had Just a Touch of Love, and, had, uh, and then after that we did Watching You. The songs took on more of a, they sounded like songs. Here just sounded like a lot of jams. I mean, basically, go in, you turn on the recording, we just go. <laughs> so by the third album that you you were you were synchronizing. Yes, that's when we really started coming together. The third album, and then the fourth with uh, watching you, and then things just people just started falling apart because they they knew that everybody knew their own skills and they knew they had much more to give, and especially with Steve Arrington. He he knew that hey. I can do this on my own. And sure enough, they went on and started their own little group, which Steve Washington was a part of that. Formed a group uh, with Steve Aaron's Hall of Fame and went on and had them start that. So there was, Slave just started branching out then into different entities. Like, like a platypus. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like a platypus. Yeah. Or, or, or. That's another. Yeah. yeah. So you know, you know when, when you look back on your music career, and uh, do you still play? Yes. Yes. Currently, I'm playing at uh, New Season Ministry. It's in uh, Huber Heights. So enjoy, enjoy. Church. Yeah. yeah. Church. And, so forth. and uh, as yeah. far as uh, composing, doing that at home, trying to fulfill a passion that I've always had, and that is doing. Uh, I want to try to get into film scoring. I've always, ever since I was little, when I first saw the first King Kong movie, I was so, wow, the music. I've had passion for that ever since. So this is something I've always wanted to do. So that's kind of my bucket list. I said, I am going to do something in movies. <laughs> Even if it's just a little snippet, if it's just the theme song. <laughs> the something. theme songs uh, have reoccurring yeah. uh, uh, royalties. Yeah. Tell me, uh, do you get royalties off of your music? Or? Yes, yes, yes. And the other thing I want to ask you is that, uh, what was one highlight, just name one highlight of your musical career? Um, I'd say, well, I'd say it had to be with Slave. When we played at uh, Madison Square Garden, who would have ever thought that I'd be playing here? That, I, like, wow. <laughs> this is like, this is, this, this is what it's all about. And then, too, to, to, uh, we played at uh, one place, uh, the Spectrum up in Philadelphia. It, it, it's such an odd feeling to get up there and play. You can't see people, but then later they tell you, oh, there was 30,000 people out there. Wow. This is, <laughs> and then, oh, then the other highlight, when we played here in Dayton, Ohio, because we hadn't played here in a long time, and we were with uh, the Commodores. <laughs> and we went through a big fight with them because we were touring, and we said, no, if we play here in Ohio, if we play here in Dayton, we want to be the, the headliner. So we went through a squabble with them. They let us do it, but that was a, that was a joy. That was a blast to play at UD Arena and really bring it back home and let people see us. I mean, we we had never never been here. So, and then we tried to lately. They tried to do a comeback. They played up at uh, what's the city? It's up north, northern Ohio. Sure. No. Cleveland. Youngstown. Youngstown. No, it was a short, short letter city. Parma? Toledo? Yeah. Akron? Akron. Akron. They played there. <laughs> and they wanted me to go, go along with them. Yes, yeah, I don't think so. I got a feeling it's going to be chaotic. Sure enough, it was. <laughs> because people were asking for more money than the, what they should have gotten. And People were arguing about the money and all kind of nonsense. I mean, here there's nobody hadn't seen you guys and be just look at, be grateful that wow, somebody actually wants 
to see you guys after all these many years. They want to see you. So, but uh, anyway, but later um, I helped out in a way because I, I did a website for the group. Uh, it's uh, slavelegacyllc.com. So up there I actually posted the actual footage of the whole thing. So it's there for prosperity, for even for them to see it. It has snapshots. Somebody took pictures, I put them all on the website. It makes you feel like you were actually there. So even though I wasn't there, I feel like I was. Hey, I helped out. <laughs> well, could, could you describe two things that happened in your career at this bar that you would say were either funny or you just said, I can't believe that happened? Being able to, to, to get out with slaves. I can't, who would have ever thought that I would hook up with these guys playing this style of music, which is way beyond what I really wanted to do. I mean, because I'm more into jazz. I'm more into uh, uh, jazz music, and here in Dayton just could not find the right kind of musicians that like to do what I like to do, play that type of music. But so I ended up with, with Slave, and I have to say that that was quite an experience. That helped me uh, learn a lot about the business, uh, learn uh, what to do, what not to do, and also be able to later uh, be a, an influence for other young kids that are trying to do this. So we were there, we were asked to come there to speak to some youth and about the music business. So we were, took question and answer, just learn and just told them the truth. Hey, here's here's what the business is really all about. And this is how you make it. These are things not to do, these are things to do. So um, of course now all that has changed because now back in the day, sure you'd have to go through a record company to get your work out there. You don't necessarily have to do that now anymore. You can go out and sell your own stuff but it depends on how hungry you are, so to speak. The only reason why you want a record company now is because they're going to front you some money in the beginning. So now at least you have some working cash to be able to do your thing. Whereas if you go on the internet and sell your own thing, you better have a backup, a job or something because you're not going to be making a lot of money. I, I don't you think it's also important that uh, the young people understand the business of of uh, being in this industry, and that songwriting is more profitable than really entertainers. You're absolutely right, because of um, um, you can write songs forever. You can't get up on the stage forever. I mean, age things like that, they all kick in and they take its toll. But songwriting, you can sit there and just write forever, and write for other artists, and, but it, all of it, a lot of it has to do with the, somewhat, a little bit of the ego involved. <laughs> a lot of us who are musicians, uh, we want to be seen, we want to be on, on the stage. And so, but when you say, well, no, just be behind the scenes and just write, some of us don't want to do that. And, uh, but hey, you make a lot of money. Now I've got to be up there. I've got to be in the line, like the spotlight. <laughs> Me, I'm, I'm that way. I don't really care about being that limelight. I can make money behind the scenes just writing. And that's what's beautiful about the music business. Uh, and I think with a lot of us, we seem to forget that it's the music business. We forget the business side of it. Fine, you can learn all the artistic side. But then when it comes down to the business, you're going to get burned. Later on, you're going to be broke. Why do you think it's important that we do have a funk center? I feel that it, it's, it's important because of the fact that it is a genre of music that needs to be um, kept alive, kept remembered, because there's I've, I've often heard, I've often been told that, for instance, if you, you can't have, you can't have a chain if you break one of the links. I mean, if you have a chain, you break one of the links, you no longer have a chain. So you cannot forget something that you past. And plus, you can learn something from it. 
you can learn something from about funk music. Uh, learn why did it become funk music. Get into the actual theory of it because it wasn't, a lot of people think that it was more of a, just people getting up there and jamming. No, there was a lot of technical stuff involved. If you listen to some of the groups, uh, George Clinton and all these people, you listen to some of their music. No, it's not just a bunch of people up there jamming. No, that's there's, definitely there's some, a there's music some thought, count. There's some thought put behind what they're doing. Yeah. It's not, they just, <laughs> and that's why I think it's so important. It's a genre of music that needs to be kept alive, that needs to be remembered, or at least to be actually just, it just still needs to be here just so that people can actually say, well, hey, look, this is how this, all this stuff that we see now, this is where it came from. And Dayton is a perfect place for right. it to be. Right. I because mean, you, yeah, if you look at groups like, like Bruno Mars, which I hate to say, but kind of disgusts me that this person comes along and getting monies <laughs> based on things that happen here. But yet, still, the artists here aren't even doing anything. But this guy comes along and piggybacks on it and capitalizes on something that he didn't even start. Matter of fact, I don't think he was born <laughs> with, when this stuff started. So he's just, he's really just mimicking what he heard. And he's only doing it because of the money, because there's money behind it, which that shows you right there. Why do I think it's important? He wouldn't have done it if it wasn't important. The company would not have backed him if it was not important. Yes, it is important. Otherwise, nobody would have backed up Bruno Mars. He would have been as popular. The, anybody who bankrolled him would have just said, why are you doing that genre of music? If they saw something in it, there's something here. There's something here. So yes, it should be a lot. It's such an unfortunate that we're letting, letting others take it from us. So. Well, Ray, I, that, that was an editorial there. And uh, I want to thank you. No, seriously, I want to thank you so much for being my guest today on uh, the Funk Chronicles. Um, I have, this is Ray Turner with Slate. And we want to just say, it's been a pleasure for you to have an opportunity to tell your story, which is so important to be archived in the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center. So this is Ryan McGlynn, your host for the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center show, Funk Chronicles. And until the next time, keep it funky. The words we sing so true Honest emotion used Our love is here to stay Thank you for the love you gave I'm gonna bite you. <laughs> I just want you to hang on. <laughs> Alright.